Amherst and um, uh, Rick um, Rawson, who uh, worked with her at UCLA for many years, is going to do the introduction. Thanks. It's a real pleasure for me to uh, introduce Liz. Uh, Liz has an interesting history, it's very kind of a different history. She's uh, done everything from teaching uh, in Japan and Korea to uh, you had a, you, your last thing you, at, in Los Angeles was a fellowship at the VA from the healthcare policy or healthcare innovation center at the VA. But mostly I know her from uh, almost 20 years of working with her at UCLA. She was uh, a key person in our health services research uh, group. Um, she was there as a project director for many years and I would go into meetings with the group and say to her, when are you going to get your PhD? You need to get your PhD because she obviously was doing PhD work, but she didn't have the degree. But as uh, Steve mentioned, she uh, moved to UMass to take a position about two years ago, and she's now assistant professor in the Department of Health Promotion and Policy in the School of Public Health uh, Sciences at UMass Amherst. Uh, her work at UCLA really was. Uh, very uh, uh, diverse in that she did. She was involved in the management and design of some of the longitudinal studies, looking at um, heroin addiction, cocaine addiction, uh, methamphetamine addiction, following people over 20, well, in some cases 30 years, uh, and she did managed all of those studies. She's done a, a variety of other work, but uh, she'll give you a, a description now of what she's doing with. Uh, Oh, the criminally uh, involved adults in the work she's doing at UMass. Liz. Thank yeah, so thank you for having me. It's great to come see Burlington University of Vermont. Um, I came here last December to meet some people uh, and I gave a talk there. So some of what I have to say today will overlap with that. But I hope to share a little bit about what I learned from those long-term follow-up studies of um, especially opioid use disorders and then transition to some of the work I'm currently working on now that's actively funded. So it's true I'm a newcomer to the Northeast. I came from Los Angeles about two years ago. Um, and so part of what I have to share is just you know, how do you manage to get research up and going quickly as a newcomer to a new community? Um, I managed to do that in my first year at UMass Amherst, so I'm excited to share um, some of the studies I've got going. Um, so I did want to share a little bit about myself. I do come from Los Angeles. I was raised in a military family, so um, my dad was a pilot in the Air Force, and we moved around quite a bit, but I mostly grew up in a suburb of Los Angeles during the time when it was the war on drugs. So this was in the 1980s, um, where there was a real focus on using sort of the resources of the military, the criminal justice system to address addiction. And um, I myself was not so sure about those policies, but still as a 14, 15 year old, you don't really question what is the status quo in our country. Um, it wasn't really until I went to college and um, I got a job as an undergraduate at night working inside the jails of San Diego. So I spent many hours interviewing people who'd just been arrested. So men, women, and also juveniles or adolescents who were being brought to the jail, often on a drug-related charge. My job was to interview them about their health history and their criminal involvement and to get a sense of why is it that they're here in jail. And so you know, I'd spend an hour with each person and it was really that job that helped me recognize, like I'm not that different from these people who are ending up in the criminal justice system. I've had advantages that many of them don't, never did have. And I was lucky to have not been involved in a family or raised in a family where drugs were commonplace. So I recognize that um, narrative as being one that explains why people are ending up in the criminal justice system, and it was sort of the origin of my wondering, well, are we appropriately addressing addiction within the criminal justice system? So that was something I was doing back in the 80s, and it's odd that I've kind of circled back to that type of work now, today. Um, I never intended to do this type of work. I sort of accidentally fell into doing addiction research, um, but probably by sharing some of my work, you'll understand what interests me about it and what I'm um, maybe wanting to hear from you about on where we might uh, develop areas of collaboration going forward. So um, 
as Rick mentioned, years later I did uh, work at UCLA for about 17 years working on longitudinal prospective follow-up studies. So these were the types of studies where we would establish a cohort of people, often who had been arrested or were getting treatment or they were in a clinic of some sort, and that was an opportunity to involve them in a study and then follow them over time. Often we would do interviews you know, three months later, six months later, one year later, five years later, 10, 20. The longest study I worked on was a 30-year follow-up of people who had heroin addiction. Um, and so that was a great learning experience, like how do you do that type of research? But uh, also to understand, well, what is it that explains the course of people's addiction? What um, are the causes and consequences of their addiction? But how can we maybe shape and develop institutions to support and promote recovery out of addiction? Um, we often follow people by talking to them, but also by mining their administrative data. So we'd acquire their records that had been collected about them from every time they got arrested or every time they got health care or every time they interacted with the child welfare system. So much of what I have to share is based on studies designed like that, observational prospective design where we talked with people, obtained their records. Sometimes we collected biological samples too to verify the concordance with their self-report. Um, and then we apply like statistical modeling to try to account for self-selection and other uh, reasons why their outcomes could look different from others. So that's just a heads up knowing that I know this center has a very strong background in do randomized clinical trials. I have had experience in that type of studies too, but much of what I share today won't be based on that type of research. So just a caveat, a heads up. If you want to leave now, you can. You're like, oh, this is not RCT. I'm not going to listen. Okay. Um, so I think everyone in the room knows there's this opioid epidemic. Um, this is, you know, the number of opioid related overdose deaths um, based on the latest data. So it's a worsening epidemic despite our efforts to address it. There is variation in the overdose death rates by region and by the characteristics of the people who have the condition for sure. Um, you probably have been exposed to this uh, influential study that came out a few years ago from Case and Deaton where they looked at American life expectancy and compared that to um, expectancy in other Western developed nations. And America stood out as having a worsening life expectancy, that red line that's going up and up, meaning Americans are living much shorter lives than their parents and grandparents today than ever before in the past since maybe we've had world wars. And that's very different from what we see in countries like France, Germany, Sweden, the UK. They have a, a life expectancy that's lengthening. This generation is expected to live a longer life than their parents or grandparents in those other countries, but not in the United States. And so why is that? Um, this was a study that also, well, what are the causes of death? And they really raised attention to how many of these deaths and the reason why people are dying at much younger ages is due to the opioid epidemic in the United States. Um, also though, suicide is a contributing factor and uh, chronic like cirrhosis, liver cirrhosis. So um, this for me sort of, the paper was written by I believe economists out of Princeton, people who don't normally study addiction. And it was interesting that it took a study like this to kind of really I think draw public attention to this crisis in ways that we hadn't seen attention being paid to it previously. Um, we continue to track changes in life expectancy. So this is the third year of just decline in American life expectancy. So it's not something that we have addressed or we've taken care of. Um, for yet another year, the third year in a row, Americans are expected to live shorter lives than their parents and grandparents. And the CDC puts out these amazing reports on well, who especially is at risk, um, how does the cause of death change over time. So unintentional injuries is now the third leading cause of death in the United States behind heart disease and cancer. So it used to be sort of much lower, but it's rising up there. Um, so it's something we can pay attention to. Um, when people I learned that I came to New England from Los Angeles, they, one of their first questions was often, why? Why are you here? It's so cold. Why would you leave Los Angeles? And one of my answers is related to what we see in this map. It's a paper that came out just I think in the early part of this year where they were looking at opioid related deaths by geography. If it's more purple or dark color, there are more deaths happening in that region compared to where it's lighter color, yellow or orangish. So New England pops out in Appalachia as a place where, especially there, the opioid overdose deaths are happening at a higher rate. And um, in a way, when I was considering my career path, I thought, well, maybe there'll be more opportunities if I were to go where the problem is especially um, a hard one, a harsh one. And that turned out to be the case. Um, there are um, 
everyone's aware, I would say, in the community I live in in Amherst, of opioids is like the top priority of an issue they want to address. And for the first time, I think, in my career, I find partners want to collaborate with me in the community, especially criminal justice partners. And that's really refreshing to be approached by them. They want to learn from us, the scientists, on how can we better address this problem. So I've had a great, I think, success in partnering with especially the criminal justice partners to launch some of the research I'll show towards the end of my talk today. Um, Massachusetts, I should have pulled the one for um, Vermont. Uh, so they have a great uh, public health surveillance system. They've created what's called this public health data warehouse, where um, for 98% of their population in the state, they're pulling all the records that exist on those people from their healthcare utilization or uh, involvement with the criminal justice system. Any public institution that you might engage with when you're in Massachusetts gets put into a public health data warehouse that then gets linked together so we can follow individuals over time and know, well, what type of health care did they get, for which condition, and what was the outcome? And how does that relate to their involvement with the criminal justice system or their exposure to the child welfare system? So this is an amazing resource for mining information for research purposes, but they're also using it to just surveil the problem by geography. So this shows in Massachusetts, the redder it is, the more deaths are happening there due to opioid overdose deaths. And they've been tracking since 2011 when they created the public health data warehouse, what are the rates of death by region and how that's changed over time. The deaths, more deaths are happening as we go west across the state. Um, and so they use this to do resource planning, right? Where should we be putting our new treatment facilities or interacting with law enforcement differently? Or maybe there's a need for um, the creating more accessible opportunities to receive buprenorphine or methadone or Vivitrol, the medications to treat opioid use disorders. So I love that I'm in Massachusetts and I'm able to mine this type of data because it's a great opportunity to study most of the population in Massachusetts and to do population level um, interventions, ideally, that's the hope. Um, so this is also looking at the opioid death rate in Massachusetts. It's worsening compared to the nation. So the death rate in Massachusetts has really spiked compared to the rest of the United States. And when I talk with people, why is that? It tends to surprise people who are from Massachusetts, right, in that they talk about how there is a strong social safety net in the state. Uh, people have health insurance. It's been in existence for more years than in other states. And so it's sort of a bit of a paradox. Why is it that the death rate in Massachusetts due to opioids is you know, high and worsening compared to other places in the United States? I still haven't found an answer, but um, some people have talked about how well because of healthcare being available to more people, maybe that meant they were more able to access inappropriately the medications or opioids, like prescribed opioids. And so others have been tracking the um, inappropriate prescribing practices in Massachusetts and how that is a problem. And maybe through their ability to get healthcare, you're also able to get medications that aren't really appropriately prescribed to you. And that could be one factor in Massachusetts that explains this higher death rate. So it's this idea that the healthcare system itself could be contributing to the epidemic in ways that we need to recognize and then address. Um, so I'm gonna transition now to um, talk about my work at UCLA. And so this is um, based on studies where we had five different longitudinal prospective follow-up studies where we followed people for 10 or more years. And we collected the same measures from people on those five studies so we could combine the data and thereby have enough sample size to then analyze, well, what is their use of different substances over time, depending on the type of substance that they're mostly addicted to, cocaine, heroin, or methamphetamine. And most of these, I think all these studies were fielded in California, so it's a California-based sample. Um, so it gave us enough sample size to look at over time what's their use pattern and to establish maybe empirically what a lot of people already kind of knew or understood, but here's some hard evidence to demonstrate. If you use heroin or opioids, you're much more likely to keep using that substance for many more years of your life than if you're using um, heroin or cocaine or methamphetamine. So this idea that opioids has a higher addiction liability, it's a, a chronic health condition in which people try to stop, they manage to stop, but they tend to return to use. So there are these cycles of quitting and starting again. Um, so this and other work coming out of UCLA especially 
help to provide support for this idea of opioid use disorder as being a chronic relapsing health condition, one that warrants disease management concepts be applied to it so that we can better help people achieve and sustain recovery. And that's maybe opposed to this idea that we can cure the condition or that we can give a brief amount of treatment and people will be fine and able to achieve recovery that's lasting. That's, that's not borne out by the evidence. Um, instead, maybe a chronic disease model is one that is the space in which I work, in part due to the research that I was involved in that supports that conceptual model. Um, so all is not lost, though. It is the case that people do manage to stop using opioids, and they do achieve recovery that's lasting. Um, this is a different application of a different statistical model to so the similar type of data looking at people over many years of their life. What is their pattern of use, and how is it different? Some people achieve a low level of use. They stop using altogether, and they maintained that good outcome for most of the next years of their life. And that's different, let's say, from these people who increase their use and they stayed at a high level for most years of their life. And these people fluctuated, they had a peak, descended in their use, it decelerated. Others, it increased over time. So this is um, growth mixture modeling. It's a statistical approach that lets us look at the heterogene heterogeneity of patterns of use over time. So it um, obviously then kind of raises natural questions, like what differentiates the people in the low use and could maintain it over time? versus others who had fluctuating use or were using at a very high level. What is it about them themselves or their interactions with the criminal justice system or healthcare that explains these different patterns? We want to identify potential turning point events because then those could be ones we target for interventions. So I'm gonna share a little bit about what we learned from those like investigation of what explains who achieved a better outcome and sustained it over time and who didn't. And one finding we came up with is that treatment with these medications to address opioid use disorders can be a turning point event. It can be an event that changes the course of someone's opioid use disorder, but it's important that they receive those medications, they continue to receive the medications. Um, so in case you're not familiar with it, I'm talking about methadone, buprenorphine, naltrexone. Those are the three FDA-approved medications to treat opioid use disorders. This is a report put out by the Surgeon General of the United States a couple of years ago, kind of the first time uh, the Surgeon General had directly addressed addiction in America in response to really the opioid epidemic. And it's a very clear guideline. Since then, many um, entities like ASAM, the American Society of Addiction Medicine Professionals, and others have put out guidelines on how to use these medications appropriately. So if you're a clinician or you work in that capacity at all, I encourage you to be aware of these medications and how to use them appropriately. Because many studies, including randomized clinical trials, have provided evidence to indicate that being retained, adhering to these medications, reduces um, use of opioids, reduces the risk of overdose death, and leads to other positive health and social outcomes. You're less likely to be arrested or incarcerated if you're staying on the medication. You're more likely to reunite with your family, to have a job. Um, so there's benefits beyond health-related ones. Um, but receiving the medications and s adhering to them is definitely a challenge, one that we're faced with now, and how do we um, address not just the provision of the medications, but helping people to remain engaged and um, continue to take them. And um, this work is consistent with my own uh, synthesis of the more than 20, 28 studies that were longitudinal prospective ones. So they studied cohorts of people with heroin or opioid addiction for at least three years in Australia, Europe, maybe the United States, all the studies from the middle down are, were fielded in the United States, the rest were in other countries. And um, each line is a study. So this study by George Valiant, he was one of the first to study heroin addiction. He established a cohort in 1952, and he followed them through 1972. What happened to them? It was mostly, I think it was all men. And so he sort of established this way of understanding addiction that many other studies kind of replicated or applied the same methods, but in different locales and different time periods. And then we mapped it to um, the era in which it was happening at the top, or sort of the, the time period. And what was happening in the world that might affect the course of the opioid disorder. So the advent of methadone became available in 1965, or the HIV epidemic really erupting in the 1980s. And how might that shape the addiction seen in these uh, cohorts of people? 
So this is just a study I point you to because it's a set of studies that come up with remarkably similar findings. And so we synthesize some of those findings. Many of them conclude like medications are a critical turning point event. Unfortunately, most people spend much of their time uh, involved in the criminal justice system. So they're likely to be using heroin or opioids for 10 or more years. Most people never ever go to treatment. Instead, they're more likely to be arrested and live within the criminal justice system and go in and out of that uh, institution um, with not very good outcomes. Um, our own study, um, so I was a part of, sorry, the three studies that are in red, including the most recently fielded long-term follow-up studies of people with opioid use disorder. And from this and other studies, we were interested in sort of kind of trying to pinpoint, well, when is it that people are most likely to be at risk of death? And so this is data from a study we looked at um, all people in California getting treatment for opioid use disorders in the publicly funded healthcare system. It was more than 20,000 people over, I think it was a 10 year period or so. And um, when is it that they died, if they died at all? And so their risk of death is here um, associated with what was the cause of death. So drug-related deaths, like from opioid overdose, was the most common cause of death in the cohort, but especially when they were out of treatment, not getting those medications, compared to when they were in treatment, getting those medications. And that was the similar pattern no matter their cause of death. So no matter what they died of, if they were in treatment getting the medications, their risk of death was much lower than if they were out of treatment not getting the medications. And especially in these time periods, the first two weeks of leaving, getting off the medication is especially high risk one, one we need to be sure clinical providers are aware of so that they can maybe re-engage, do work to re-engage people in care, make sure people know that maybe their tolerance has changed. If you were to stop the medication and then return to using opioids or heroines out in the world, your risk of death is much higher than when you first entered treatment. Um, and since then, others have come up with similar uh, findings. So this is a study out of British Columbia where they also similarly use public, or not public, but uh, treatment records to analyze everyone in the healthcare system and what is their risk of death over time, over a 17-year period, um, in relation to their use of the medication or not. So if they were staying on buprenorphine or methadone, they are much less likely to die than if they go off of it. So sort of a replication of my own work, um, kind of establishing what we're finding is not unique to any one place. It's sort of a universal finding. Um, other studies have since done work in Australia and elsewhere, coming up with very similar findings. Um, I was part of a randomized clinical trial where they were looking at comparing two different medications to address opioid use disorders. So this was a multi-site uh, national study involving um, I think it was eight sites in five states where we were enrolling people as they entered treatment for heroin or opioids um, to randomize them to receive either methadone or buprenorphine. And then later, we were funded to do, to do a follow-up study of the cohort. So this was a basically an eight-year follow-up study of that cohort. And we were interested to know if their use was different by medication type and we then compared that to not being on any medication at all. So this is the two medications, buprenorphine or methadone, compared to not getting either of those medications. And what does their opioid use look over time? So the picture shows and the data supports if you're on either of those medications, you have a much better outcome, you're less likely to be using opioids than if you're not on any of the medications and there's not a difference between either of the medications. So both of them are equally effective at reduce, reducing opioid use over time. Um, so this idea like either medication is good, much better than no medication at all. Um, from that same study, that same multi-site randomized clinical trial, we also most recently looked at criminal justice outcomes. So this was looking at you know, opioid use, our primary outcome. Um, but we were getting questions about, but what about the recidivism? Their likelihood of being rearrested or reincarcerated over time is one medication better than another? How does that predict their likelihood of being involved in the criminal justice system? And um, this paper was just accepted by addiction, yes, uh, recently. Took two years of time to get it to this stage. 
um, but such a simple graph, <laughs> demonstrating that um, with either medication, they're less likely, much less likely to be rearrested or reincarcerated than if they're not getting any medication at all. Um, so again, providing empirical evidence for what many of us kind of understood or believe is happening, but here we have evidence to support that finding. Um, other work I was involved in was interested in not just can people achieve recovery from opioid use disorder, but how can they sustain that good change? So, you know, the cycles of relapse is a real challenge. They achieve a period of no use but return to use. And so we were interested in trying to identify can we predict who achieves lasting abstinence from heroin or other opioids? And some of our work helped to establish if you can get to at least five years of abstinence, you're likely to sustain that abstinence over the next 10 years. So establishing this benchmark of time of abstinence that then predicts future abstinence. And what was related to getting to that five-year marker, that five-year benchmark, um, it was different by race, ethnicity. So people who were Hispanic were less likely to get to that five-year benchmark. People who were white were more likely to get to that benchmark. Um, those who had higher self-efficacy, so they felt like I'm able to achieve recovery. I know I can do this. I have the skills, ability, resources. I'm surrounded by people who can help me get to recovery and stay in that uh, mode. And then those who had lower psychological distress, so those without comorbid uh, mental health conditions like anxiety or depression. Uh, if you had the absence of that, you were more likely to get to the five-year benchmark. So these are maybe areas to intervene and to educate people as they enter treatment. Treatment might be this long-term process you're embarking on. Uh, well, let's take some baby steps to get you into recovery and help you achieve lasting recovery. We want to address any mental health conditions you might have on board because that's going to help you achieve lasting recovery, help you feel able to stay in recovery, and then to better understand these differences by race ethnicity. I don't have an explanation for it, but it's, you know, area for future research. Um, similarly, a more recent cohort, we did replicated that analysis because uh, this analysis was based on a cohort from the early 2000s, um, and you know the opioid epidemic is changing. This, the rise of fentanyl and other substances could explain different uh, long-term course of people's addiction. So we replicated that uh, finding with a more recent cohort of people. We found that you know 30 percent or so could achieve five years of abstinence from heroin. 20 percent could get to five years of abstinence from all opioids, both the heroin and the pills. And um, getting to that marker was associated with these factors. So older age at first use, right? They first started using opioids at a much older age. That predicts a better outcome over time. They're less impulsive. They've been in treatment. And for a longer period of time, they're getting those medications. That predicts five years of abstinence. They're surrounded by people. They have great social support. They're surrounded by people who support them in seeking treatment and staying engaged in care as opposed to maybe those who um, kind of project social stigma around the medications themselves. So methadone especially often comes with uh, people's views that it's replacing one drug for another and you're not really in recovery if you're receiving that medication. So if you're surrounded with people like that in your life, you're, you're less likely to stay engaged with the medication and achieve a good outcome. So it's this idea that what people say and think about the medications is an area to target as well. Um, we need to be sure people are informed about the benefits of the medication and that it is the evidence-based gold standard of care that we should be making available to people with this condition. Um, so this is just a list of the challenges we're still facing today that you hopefully have ideas on what to do about these problems. So very few people with opioid use disorder ever do go get medications or other treatment to address that condition, 10% or less. Our estimates, prevalence estimates of treatment utilization aren't that great. Um, I think in Massachusetts, I talked about that public health data warehouse. They recently published a paper looking at prevalence of opioid use disorder and use of treatment, and they came up with higher prevalence rates of opioid use disorder than what's available in nationally representative survey data and lower use of treatment. So we're still refining the methods to know prevalence rate, but from what we know, very few people ever go get treatment. Um, of those that do have the problem, they tend to use for 10 or more years before they ever go get care. So that's a long time to have an untreated health condition. 
one that comes with a lot of like collateral, collateral burdens like lack of education, no employment or very little employment history, uh, fractured relationships with friends and family. These all then become risk factors for continued use that need to be addressed as a part of the treatment process. Um, often people go, when they do go to treatment, it's at a facility that doesn't offer them the medications. So these abstinence-based programs are ones that often don't endorse the use of the medications, and I think that's changing, uh, but it's taken some time for people to come around and, and recognize they need to provide these medications. Um, I think some of these are going to, like through court cases now where patients can sue for they're not being provided the opportunity to receive medications. In Massachusetts, there was a case that was just settled recently um, that was someone involved with the criminal justice system who was not able to get their medication when they entered, were arrested, and the criminal justice system lost the case, meaning now it's becoming a mandate jails and prisons in Massachusetts must offer these medications to everyone with this health condition going forward as of a certain date coming up this September. Um, and then yes, when people do get the medications, non-adherence is a problem. They don't necessarily stay in engaged with care for a lot of reasons. Some of it's their own personal uh, you know, situation, their preferences, um, but also it's things like they don't have health insurance that covers the medication or they're not aware that it covers the medication or they can only get 90 days of it or the treatment center is located very far from where they live. Um, these are all sort of uh, factors that we can address as public health workers. Uh, what can we do to make it easier for people to receive care? Um, I became interested in why is it especially that people engage with buprenorphine, kind of a newer medication to treat opioid use disorder, but then either stay engaged with it or stop taking it. So from that multi-site clinical trial I talked about before, we had measures of who did stay engaged with the buprenorphine treatment over five years, and this is an analysis of just two years of time. Who was likely to stay engaged with buprenorphine, the people at the top, over the whole two years, and who wasn't, these other lines down here, in relation to their um, perception that they can access the medication, and also in relation to do they accept the side effects that come with taking the medication. So we had these two moderators of whether or not they continue to keep taking the medication. And the modeling results indicated, the study concluded, well, for those who perceived buprenorphine to be both accessible, like they could get it when they needed it, and also acceptable, they were okay with the physiological side effects and other um, uh, things that come with taking the medication, they were most likely to stay engaged with that medication over time. Very different from those who found the medication to be unacceptable or could not access it. So I guess this paper kind of highlights how, yes, we are making great strides and a lot of resources are being put into making buprenorphine accessible and that's a worthwhile endeavor. We should need to continue to do that. At the same time, we probably have to work with patients about, well, how does that medication help you, make you feel? Do you like it or not? And then address those factors as to why they don't like the medication. Um, so some of the side effects could be reasons why they stop taking it. They prefer to return to using heroin or opioids over taking the medication. That's something we need to be aware of and address with patients. Um, so a challenge, well, people need five or more years of the medication to get to lasting recovery. That's often not how people think when they're entering care to be treated for heroin or opioids. Um, they're often maybe thinking, I'll be here for a month or 90 days and then I'll be good. I'm going to be cured or I'll have detoxed from this condition. And um, their expectation maybe needs to be reset or adjusted, hopefully by the clinicians they're interacting with, um, to better orient themselves to this idea that you might need long-term engagement with care. This is a chronic health condition for which you need to learn how to manage. It might mean you're staying in care for some time. I'm going to help you figure out how to do that. And so that expectation might be a more realistic, useful one than endorsing the idea that, yes, you can be here for 30 or 90 days and then you're going to be fine. Um, that's not really the case. It's not what we see is borne out by the evidence. Um, so some of the work I'm doing now is working with methadone clinics in the Western Massachusetts area. Um, they're using evidence-based care, but they um, struggle with how do you help 
set patient expectations? How do you engage in like a shared decision making process so that the patient values and prefers to stay engaged with care that is aligned with the evidence base for their staying engaged with care? Um, and it's hard. It takes a lot of time to develop that rapport with patients. So it's this idea of, yes, it's important physicians be a part of that conversation, but others in the clinical setting could take on that role as well. All of that work doesn't need to be done by the physician alone. The nurse practitioner, the other staff in the facility can be um, interacting with patients in meaningful ways. Um, and then how do we create these recovery resources? So helping people to engage with positive social support. They've spent many years of their life often in a setting uh, it's a drug using world, a subculture, and it's hard to break away from that. They're now engaged with treatment and changing their life in ways that mean breaking maybe contact with those who they've known and trusted for many years of their life. So how to create opportunities for them to make new friends and feel valued um, in other settings. And other work that I do, epidemiological work, it's very clear that people with opioid use disorder, maybe more than 80% of them have been exposed to childhood adversity. So before the age of 18, they had physical sexual abuse and other experiences of childhood adversity. And then as adults, their experiences of trauma are much higher than what happens among people who don't have that health condition. So trauma-informed care is a buzzword we hear a lot, but what does that mean in practice? How do you actually do trauma-informed care in healthcare settings, but maybe in communities? So Massachusetts is interested in creating trauma-informed communities. You're trying to apply that in a public health realm, and I'm sort of learning what, what does that look like, what does that mean? But um, part of it is educating institutions about you know, what the population they serve, what kind of risk factors they likely have, and how can you structure what it is that you do to be a welcoming space where people want to come and engage with what it is that you're offering to them. Um, and then opportunities for new de identity development. So um, I'm working with women who've been in treatment for opioid problems to hear from them, well, would you be interested in telling your story of recovery in like a digital storytelling fashion, like making a short, a three minute video of their life that they could use to help stay in recovery, but to educate other women like themselves. What does it mean to be in treatment? What can you expect? And what do you get from it? What, what's worthwhile about that? So they're very eager to share their stories and kind of change the social stigma around opioid addiction. Um, but you know, how to create opportunities for them to do that in ways where they won't be penalized for sharing their story of addiction and recovery is a challenge we're talking over now. Uh, so the rest of this is about my current work, which is involved with the criminal justice system. And it comes out of the story, my own personal story, of working within that system when I was an undergrad, um, but also in recognition of the research showing many years are spent in incarcerated settings. Very few people get treatment. And those criminal justice settings are often places where people with opioid use disorder cannot access the medications. They're not offered or delivered inside that setting. So if you were to get arrested, you have to stop cold turkey. So imagine you're addicted to heroin or pills and you get arrested pretty soon, withdrawal and other symptoms are gonna kick in. It's a horrible experience for people who become incarcerated. Um, and often once you get released, it's just you're released. There's not a lot of aftercare or planning for re-entry into the community. Um, so I was excited to work with jails in Massachusetts that are kind of on the forefront of doing something very different. In Greenfield, um, in Franklin County, Massachusetts, north of Amherst, it's one of the fewer than 30 jails in the nation that is offering medications inside the jail to people who are incarcerated. Um, so I'm partnering with them to study what it is that they do and what are the outcomes of their provision of that medication. Um, but they're also very serious about doing better linkage to people as they leave jail, get them into care in the community that same day. Um, so they're often playing a public health role. They are criminal justice players, yet they're the ones driving the person to the treatment center, making sure they've got their insurance all set up, making sure they have a place to live. And that's just never happened. I've never worked in that realm where it's the jail playing this role. And so it's sort of an exciting space to be in. And um, I think a lot of the impetus for that came out of the data that Massachusetts was producing from that public health data warehouse, helped establish especially this. For those who'd been incarcerated, their risk of death was 120 times higher than if they'd never been incarcerated. And so this was, again, that public health data warehouse helped establish this finding that got a lot of attention 
a couple of years, maybe two years ago, and it became then a priority in the governor's office to do something about the opioid problem, but especially among the criminal justice population. And that finding was found in other um, peer-reviewed publications, like the risk of death is very high when people that leave prison and jail. Right? Their tolerance level has changed, but they're often not aware that's the case. So when they leave jail, they use heroin or opioids at a level that was the same as when they went in, but because their tolerance level has changed, they can't tolerate it. It's now a lethal dose. Um, so um, I'm going to transition to my current studies. So mentioning that Franklin County Jail is one of the few jails that was offering buprenorphine inside the jail, both inducting people onto it or continuing their current prescription when they got arrested. And they've been doing that since 2015, but they never studied the outcomes. They never knew well, what happens to people over time. So I appeared on the scene like, well, maybe we should uh, study this. And it became a natural experiment type of study in that the nearby county, Hampshire County Jail, was not delivering these medications. So it was an opportunity to sh study both cohorts. One went to Franklin and got the medications, went to, went to Hampshire and didn't. Both groups left jail. And now we can recontact them and follow them one to five years after they left the jail to understand what proportion of them died, what proportion got care in the community, are they still using opioids, what about their infectious disease behaviors, are they different depending on the jail that they were incarcerated in. Um, so that study's underway now, it's um, in collaboration with Peter Friedman, uh, addiction medicine physician who uh, does a whole lot of research, um, so he's been a great mentor for me to work with. At the same time we recognize, well, uh, Franklin has already developed processes to deliver these medications in jail. So why don't we have Franklin teach the Hampshire jail how to do that? So this idea of peer-based translation of information from one site to another. And so we secured a SAMHSA grant for the next three years for one jail to teach the other how to deliver these medications and then to study those implementation science practices, um, but then also to look at the outcomes over time. Um, this is also, you know, it's a program, a service delivery type of grant that I'm hoping will be the foundation of research studies. So now that I'm embedded in the jail, it's an opportunity to do other type of work in these two jails. Um, aside from that, I was funded by a foundation grant to consider the ethics of the opioid epidemic, something I've never done before, but it's sort of a, I guess, a bonus of being an academic or a scholar is the chance to kind of learn something new. So this foundation was um, interested in ideas of how do we address ethical issues around the opioid epidemic. And I proposed this idea, well, in Massachusetts, uh, a lot of people get committed to treatment against their will. So involuntary civil commitment is used quite frequently in Massachusetts, um, up there with what happens in Texas and Florida. And more than 6,500 people a year are mandated to treatment against their will for opioid and alcohol and other issues, but especially now it's for opioids. So I'm talking with people who run the civil commitment programs. Well, how do we do this better? What's really happening? I'm learning, and the you know, data collection is happening now, that yes, it halts imminent death in the moment. Right? It's reserved for people who are at risk for imminent harm to themselves and others, and it's needed to stop an overdose event happening right then and there. But they're often sent to places where those medications to address opioid problems are not made available to them. So they're put in treatment settings where they must be detoxed immediately, and then often when they exit that place, they're just released into the community without any aftercare planning. So there's opportunities to improve that process or to think about whether we really want to use involuntary civil commitment at all. Um, another thing I'm studying under this is that use of that big data, the big data public, the public health data warehouse. So that is an amazing resource for research purposes, but it was created often without the knowledge or input of the population much less the uh, people, the target population. So how do we ensure that it's used in a way that we continue to have public trust in government? You know, it can feel a little big brotherish, right? Like all of our data is being put into a massive repository that researchers can analyze and no one really knows what, what they're doing or what's happening with it. There's actually a lot of um, processes put in place to make sure that that data is used appropriately, but I don't think that that is being translated into the public sphere. So the study is all around how do we better use that um, well in a way that generates public trust in government. So that's ongoing work. And then I want to mention I am trying to build on that work with the jails to compete for this um, center grant we just submitted in 
a couple months ago in February. I'm trying to block it out of my mind. It was a very stressful event. So <laughs> to establish a, a night at JCoin Center. So this would be a, a criminal justice focused research center in partnership with Peter Friedman, my collaborator out of, he works at Bay State Health. And um, NIDA is interested in funding these research centers around the country. It creates a network of centers that are partnered with players in the community, in the criminal justice world, and they're ready to launch research quickly to do the research and then take the findings and translate them into practice. So it's very similar to like a clinical trials network, if any of you have ever been engaged with that. Similar concept, but now it's all focused on the criminal justice system and the opioid problem. So if it were funded, fingers crossed, I'll know in June, um, we have these four studies embedded within it. Um, it's be a five-year effort that involves multiple institutions and involves seven jails in the state of Massachusetts, all of whom have community partners lined up, more than 20 community partners. So it's the chance to do research we're interested in doing, but could also be a platform for a lot of other studies down the road, we're hoping. So to be continued, maybe some of you are also competing for a JCoin grant. If so, I hope we're all at the table in fall to work together, that would be great. So that's some of my own work. Um, I am a public health scientist, that's my background. Um, I was trained in public health principles, and this is a core concept, you know, how do you influence the health, what are the determinants of health? Of course, we're interested in personal, individual level factors, your biology, who you are, your age, gender, your sex, or um, your biology, all are important uh, determinants of your health, but Above and beyond that, and maybe what I'm most interested in are these other outer level factors, the public policies, institutions. How is it what they do influences health outcomes? And how does that play out differently depending on the historical era in which we're living, but also where you're at in your life course? So study people over time. What impacts a 15-year-old is gonna be very different from what impacts a 45-year-old. Um, so that's sort of the approach that I'm taking. Usually I have a group of students and I challenge them, like where is it that you're interested in making a difference in addressing the opioid epidemic? There's lots of opportunities here to play a role. And that's it. Yeah. All right. We have a um, good number of at least uh, 10 minutes for questions. Yeah. yeah. Or, One over there on the left. Oh, yeah, okay.